Okay, we are live. I'm just waiting for the YouTube page to load. Yes, okay, we are live. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we have a really exciting event planned for you. So my name is Aditya and I'm the head of company relations at Ed Intelligence. And today we are joined by, by Mine Chintikaya Rundel. Please tell me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, she is a senior lecturer in the School of Mathematics at the, at the University of Edinburgh and a data scientist and professional educator at R Studio, the folks who, who make R. Uh, Mina's work re, uh, focuses on innovation in statistics and data science pedagogy. Mina organizes the American Statistical Association's Data Fest, and she also contributes to the Open Intro Project. Mina is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the International Statistical Institute. So we're looking forward to her talk on uh, growing your inner data scientist and tips for success uh, in a data science career. So yeah, whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. I believe you're muted. Oh, thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, OK, does this look OK? Yeah. Uh, there is a slight delay between the call and the what appears on YouTube, so I'll let you know. OK. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Well, thank you for having me. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about growing your inner data scientist and give you basically some uh, tips, hopefully, for success as a data scientist. So this sorry, is me. There's a, sorry to interrupt, there's a slight issue with your slides. It's not showing them properly. So if you could maybe unshare and reshare. Oh yeah. Let's try it again. Okay, perfect. That's good now. Okay, wonderful. So today I wanna to talk about growing your inner data scientist and I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that in a second. So this is me and uh, I am a person of uh, you know, many roles in life. So I'm a statistician by training. I'm also a data scientist, I'm a book author, but I also wanna talk about something else, um, giving examples from myself, but also hopefully uh, leading you in different directions of what you can do as a data scientist. So these are all the places you can find me on the web. And this is not just the talk about web presence, but there is going to be a big part of that that we're going to talk about. So if you recognize some of these um, icons, you can find me on GitHub, you can find me on Stack Overflow, on uh, our studio community, on Twitter, um, and I also blog a little bit. So I want to say a little bit about these things and how they actually help make uh, a data scientist a whole. So I'll, I'll start with the uh, generic question of what is data science. And the thing is, if you were to just Google data science, you come across, well, you come across lots of bizarre things. And then some things that like, make a little bit more sense. There's always these diagrams of binary, like zeros and ones flying into somebody's brain. I don't necessarily know what they're supposed to say about data science, but here are some things that maybe uh, look a little less fancy, but make a little bit more sense. Um, and here, what we're seeing is that in general, there is a cycle of data science. Uh, working with data has many, many stages. And as a data scientist, you want to basically have a handle on all of these stages. And the thing is, some of these um, diagrams also miss crucial steps of being a data scientist as well. So I want to talk a little bit about those. So data science is evolving ultimately, and there's not a great agreement of what it is. And I think that's what makes it exciting as opposed to being confusing. Uh, it makes it exciting because as people who are um, choosing a career in data science now or in the near future, you are basically saying, I want to shape what data science can be. So here are some uh, tips uh, for growing your inner data scientist. The first one is always be curious. So what do I mean by this? Uh, one of the things you wanna do is you wanna keep current. Now, if you're studying to be a data scientist, um, hopefully your coursework is doing this, but chances are um, it's possible that coursework tends to lag behind what's really happening uh, in the landscape of data science. Um, even if at you know 
particular steps of your coursework, you're uh, studying things that are extremely current, uh, there's always the possibility that new things are happening that you want to stay uh, current with. Um, that means read articles, read books, read blogs. Um, so I want to give you some examples of the types of things that I like to read. Um, I like reading blogs by data scientists where they write about data science in a way where I get to learn about the tooling, for example. So Julia Selge is a data scientist and a software engineer who works at our studio and she works on natural language processing problems uh, and also modeling in general, so building tools for modeling. A lot of her blog posts uh, tend to be text analysis related, which is not something I'm officially trained in, but I like learning about, so I like reading through those. Um, there are aggregator blogs, things like R Weekly is one of them, um, where you can basically see what's been happening in the landscape of a particular um, computing language. So in this case, R, but I'm sure there are um, kind of analogs of this in other languages as well. Um, and so you can actually find out about these on a weekly basis and get snippets of them. Um, there are uh, well-established kind of blogs on data visualization. I personally enjoy doing data visualization and reading about it. So flowing data is one that's been around for years and years. And um, the author of the uh, blog flowing data uh, often finds either shares um, visualizations that he makes, but also regularly shares um, kind of impressive visualizations and also visual stories that others have made. Um, and oftentimes, many of these are accompanied with the code to produce these visualizations as well. Um, podcasts are another way to keep up to date. So not so standard deviations is a very popular kind of data science related podcast. Um, and also another thing that, uh, um, that seems to be more um, popular nowadays than I'd say a few years ago is um, newsletters. So it seems like people are uh, moved on from newsletters to blogs at some point and now they're going back. So this uh, Norm Cortec is a newsletter written by Vicky Boykis, who is a um, machine learning data scientist, uh, but she also writes about kind of the societal impacts of certain um, uh, data science decisions and how they're being implemented in businesses. So we've got st started with uh, reading about tooling specifically to reading about high level topics of like, how does this actually affect society and technology? And I would recommend, um, the reason why I gave these things is to show um, kind of the landscape of varied things you could be reading. This is not to say you should be reading every single one of these or these specific things, but read a lot and find authors, uh, whether these are newsletter authors, blog authors, or book authors, whose tone you enjoy reading and then continue to read from them. Um, it's also important to keep engaged. So this means you could be going to conferences, workshops, meetups, webinars. So I wanted to give some examples of things um, that are uh, free to participate in. So many, um, there are webinars, and I think there are more and more of those now that we're not really uh, meeting in person. So this is an example of the periodic webinars our studio runs. Some of them, as you can see, are specific to particular R packages and so tooling, and others are more high level about working in a data science team. Um, the Carpentries is a foundation, um, an organization that's been around for uh, years and years now, and um, they, there's groups within Edinburgh as well um, that are associated with the sub-carpentry groups of data carpentry, library carpentry, and software carpentry, where they run lots of workshops. Um, uh, on a variety of computing languages and also about workflows. And I would strongly recommend that you engage with those. Um, meetups are another thing. So uh, lots and lots of meetup groups, all of which uh, nowadays have virtual meetups basically. Um, so um, two big ones in terms of data science is the Edinburgh R user group and the Pi Data Edinburgh group. These uh, groups tend to meet uh, monthly. Um, our Ladies Edinburgh is also an R affiliated organization. So an R Ladies is an organization that whose mission is to increase um, gender diversity within the R community. And I'm one of the co-organizers of R Ladies Edinburgh and we're, you know, um, we try to meet on a monthly basis. And um, these are great places to not only learn about the best and newest in tooling, but also to start learning. So not just the newest things, but also the, uh, the basics and also to network. 
Um, another one that is Edinburgh specific is this group called Coding Club, whose uh, work I've been really impressed by if you go to their website. So I believe they're a group of um, researchers and graduate students here at the University of Edinburgh who run these um, uh, coding workshops. And they seem to be um, uh, producing really you know, top material and they're um, often freely available for participants. Um, another thing you can do beyond learning is to improve your workflow and there it is never too late to do so. Um, one of the things about workflow is that this tends to be the thing that is not always taught in co coursework. So when we think about being a data scientist, the first thing that comes to mind probably is learning about data, which tends to be covered in coursework. The second thing that uh, comes to mind is learning programming languages, and those are also covered well in courses. But workflow is not always something that tends to make the kind of the primary focus of coursework, but it is so, so essential. And the earlier you adopt good workflows, the more successful a data scientist you're going to be, even if the group you ultimately end up working in has a different workflow than yours. If you know the basics, you're going to go far. So the two really important things I would very strongly recommend incorporating into your workflow as early as you can and to use it relentlessly is working reproducibly and using version control. There is no data science team out there um, who, well, let me put it this way. There's no data science team out there that is doing truly exciting work and impactful work that is not working reproducibly and that is not using version control. Um, if you want to get started with things like this, I'll give some examples from the R world. Uh, some of you might be uh, learning R and some of you might be learning other languages. And if so, look for parity in the other languages as well as much as you can. Um, so here's some excerpts from the uh, R for Data Science book. Uh, which has specific chapters on workflow basics for write, working with R code and also organizing your work in projects. Um, R Open Size. Our Open Sci is a um, nonprofit organization that is basically um, that aims to kind of um, uh, provide resources for researchers working in uh, computational sciences. And they have a really nice reproducibility guide where they outline um, not just the tooling, but also the idea behind how should I be um, kind of managing my workflow so that it is not only reproducible, but also um, easier for others to follow as well and uh, suitable for collaboration. Um, another example I'll give is also from the R world. Um, this book called um, What They Forgot to Teach You About R is all about things that is not specifically about R code, but that's about being a better R programmer. So these are things about how do you organize your files? How do you organize your scripts? How do you do version control? So on and so forth. So um, these are not the things that you're going to see in your introductory course for a particular computing language. And then when you get to higher level courses, oftentimes um, courses assume that this is the sort of stuff you can, you know, pick up on the street. And yes, you can. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm uh, suggesting that you do, but do so in a manner where you actually can uh, follow some certain certain guidelines and actually hold yourself up to those standards as you're working on your, even if it's just your coursework. Uh, number three is share your output. So I'll give you uh, this example from, um, uh, from a talk that I've heard uh, back in 2019, right? The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Public Work by David Robinson, uh, who is a data scientist. And this is what he started his um, talk with this diagram. Um, basically thinking about how he used to think of his goals, uh, going from just an idea, which is not so valuable, to published paper, which would be more valuable. And basically in between these, we have these kind of goalposts of preliminary results, draft manuscript, completed manuscript. And really how he says he should have been thinking about them is that anything still on your computer is less valuable, anything out in the world is more valuable. So what he means by this is that really, if you are hiding your work to yourself, data, code, results, drafts, even a finished paper, that's not going to be as valuable as anything you're sharing with the rest of the world. And so sharing your work um, 
allows you to, um, you know, become members of communities, um, basically get other people's acquainted with your work. And also the more you share, the more you learn because you'll see interest in your work from others that where uh, sometimes it'll be in um, terms of kind of positive uh, comments. Sometimes they're going to be constructive and each and one, every one of those constructive comments will be an opportunity to learn as well. And sometimes collaborations actually get born out of uh, sharing your work publicly. So how might you think about sharing your work? Basically share the things that you create. Um, it might be big things you create. So I'll start ambitiously. Um, I'll give you an example of this project I've been working on over the last few years. Um, so I teach an introductory data science course. I teach one here at the University of Edinburgh as well. And um, what I do is I teach that course and at the end of the semester, I could put away my materials and then tuck them away until the next year I teach it again. Instead, um, I'd been thinking there's a lot of appetite for seeing how people are teaching this sort of content um, because it is a, a new thing, especially for our statisticians to be uh, teaching. And also it's a constantly changing landscape with new, new tools and new ideas coming about um, continuously. So there's always a question of how do we teach data science? And I'm not claiming that uh, the way I teach data science is how we can best teach data science. I thrive to, but I'm not necessarily claiming that it is the best way. But if we are thinking about how do we teach, and if that's an open conversation, I figured why not open source all of the course materials, share it with the rest of the world, and let's see what they think. And so there's been lots and lots of faculty members who are using these materials to teach themselves. They're not just using them as is, of course, what they're doing is they're borrowing ideas, but more importantly, as they borrow ideas, they give feedback. If you are going to be building something big and sharing it with the world, something you wanna get yourself familiar with uh, is licensing your work as well. So I would recommend using an open license, like a Creative Commons license. And uh, many projects make it really, if you're especially hosting your project on GitHub, they make it really easy to add this sort of a file, but that's something to keep in mind as you're starting to share your work. But you should also think about sharing the little things that you create as well. So I'm going to give an example of what might be something little that you create. Um, so this was a, um, a couple of years ago, but um, I just came across this tweet um, on Twitter. Uh, I think it was a Sunday morning, if I remember correctly. And this person said, is it just me or did I just pull off the greatest Twitter scheme of all time? And then they said, read the first of first word of my tweets to find out. And I don't even follow this person, but they had gotten so many likes that I think it kind of came up to the top of my um, uh, timeline. And I was thinking, I really don't want to read through their tweets because what they meant to say is that um, the, on, when you go on their uh, timeline, you can see both their tweets and then things they responded to. And this particular tweet didn't... Uh, actually mean the tweets they responded to. They were only talking about the tweets they wrote. And it was just like not clear to me how to get through this. And I thought, hey, I should be able to write an R script to do this. So I did, I did write an R script, which takes just a um, um, few lines of code to do that. And lots and lots of people like this. The reason why I bring this up is that I do tweet all the time, but I don't think any of my tweets actually get this many likes ultimately. So I wanna walk you through very quickly what I was doing here. Um, and this is not meant to be a lesson in R, but more a lesson in how kind of you can get inspired to engage with data, um, even in context where it might seem like it's not an obvious choice to do so. So in order to solve this problem, I use three R packages. One of them is Tidyverse. The other one is RTweet, which is a, so Tidyverse is an, uh, kind of a suite of eight packages um, that are designed to work, do data science in R uh, efficiently, basically. And uh, RTweet is a R package that is, um, useful for speaking to use making calls to the Twitter API from within R. And glue is a package for kind of gluing together text strings, basically. So what I did was using these, I used the um, kind of get timelines function from RTweet. 
to get the timeline of this particular uh, Twitter user whose name was Costco Rice Bag. And I said, uh, okay, let's just get their 3,200 latest tweets. I think that's the, um, that's not the maximum number you can get, but I figured it's a high number. Um, so I'll start with that and see. Uh, I wasn't really sure how many of their tweets I needed to go back to. And I stored that object as something called TML, so short for timeline. And then I said, um, I only want the tweets that they want, as opposed to who tweets where they replied to somebody. So if the field called reply to screen name is NA, so if that's empty, then I basically um, um, want those tweets and any tweets where they re reply to somebody else, I don't want them. So we filtered for those. And then I realized uh, as I was looking through that they actually meant that they were able to pull off this uh, scam where they wrote the lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody. So I looked up the song Bohemian Rhapsody and this, uh, so what's the first few uh, words in it and what's the last? So it starts with the text, is it just me? And then it ends with uh, the word blows being repeated over and over. So basically I'm saying slice these data for um, text strings that are between, is it just me and blows? And then um, give me the first word of all of these tweets. So I only want the first word, I don't want the whole thing. And then if you collapse them all together, basically from their tweets, you get the lyrics to, um, a bohemian rhapsody so here's an example of something that probably take me i took me i don't know maybe an hour on and off uh to figure out looking at some of the documentation um not that it should take an hour i was it was a sunday morning and i was hanging out at home with my kid so i wasn't really paying attention to it but it was engaging it was fun ultimately and i learned a couple things i hadn't actually played with that r tweet package before so i decided hey Here's a reason finally to play with this package and learn about it. Um, so look for opportunities like this where you might, you know, find something fun and engaging for you. And then when you do share it with the rest of the world. Um, also share the things that you learn. So um, here's a quote from Mary Averick. She is the developer advocate. Uh, for the uh, Tidyverse engineering team. So the group of people who work on Tidyverse packages. Um, and basically the way she describes what she does is sometimes I go on Twitter and I tend to learn out loud. So she reads lots and lots of blog posts and then actually will write very short tweets about them. And the nice thing about Twitter is how short it is. Um, and so that means that when you read something, you really kind of need to wrap your head around it. That doesn't mean you can follow every single technical detail about it, but you need to wrap your head around what it is that, that, that what it is the thing that you read and what is the takeaway message. And also basically file it in your head as this might come handy sometimes. I really don't see myself using it anytime in the near future, but being able to get to that level. And if you're already doing it, sharing it with the rest of the world can be really, really helpful. Um, so this was me sharing with the rest of the world something um, I happen to know and use a lot. And every single time I, um, I do this when I'm doing live coding in front of a group, people think that I'm doing some sort of wizardry, which is that you can actually do kind of write in multiple lines in R. So it's just alt click and then you can uh, kind of drag down and write on multiple lines simultaneously. This is a useful tool for when you're coding, when you have to do like the same uh, thing over and over again for multiple variables, for example. But even though I know this, I know that people also find it surprising. So I thought, hey, maybe lots of people know it, but I'll share it with the rest of the world. And it's one of the tweets that people come back to and say, hey, I actually started using this in my workflow. Um, here's another one. Uh, this was from a while back, um, but in 2015, I had written about um, what happens uh, if you use kind of the wrong uh, operator when you're using these two R packages, ggplot2 and dplyr. One of them uses an operator called the pipe operator, which you can see in the middle of your screen with that uh, percentage greater than percentage sign. And then if you scroll down a little bit, the other one uh, uses a plus operator, 
between the layers uh, that you build with these two packages. So the blog post was about, okay, what happens if you use the wrong operator? And you get a really, really cryptic R message. Well, actually you used to get a really, really cryptic R, message, uh, R error message that you can see at the very bottom of the screen. Mapping should be a list of unevaluated mappings created by AES or AES string. It means nothing to me. I mean, from that, you would never get, hey, is it possible you mixed up the two operators in your code? Well, um, if you sometimes when you blog about these things and you raise it to the attention of um, folks who are um, working on these packages, I think as of March 2019, if you make that same mistake now, you actually do get a, um, you actually do get a more, um, reasonable error message that basically tells you, did you use the wrong operator? Now, this is not to say this change happened because of me. I, I very strongly doubt that. But it is to say that um, I could have also gotten across, come across that error and thought, oh my God, I, I must be the only person who struggles with this sort of stuff. Um, I, I'm not really sure what to do with it. Um, I suppose I need to be able to decipher that error and understand what it means. But instead I wrote about it and saying, I think that seems like an error that's really hard to pa parse. There has to be something more humane the uh, software could tell me that would point me in the right direction. And if this change happened in the software, that basically means other people thought so as well. So that's kind of like comforting to see. Um, another thing is to share your questions. So sharing questions is good, but I'll give you another um, uh, quote here from Tiago Masiera, who said, the most useless problem statement that one can face is it doesn't work, yet we seem to get it far too often. So when you're sharing your questions, as in you're struggling with something you're doing, and you are thinking, it just doesn't work. It's supposed to work. My code is supposed to run, but it's simply not working. Oftentimes we tend to pose a question that basically starts with help me, it doesn't work, but that's not actually helpful. So asking good questions is a really, really useful skill and one that you're going to um, get over time and build over time. So here's an article. It's a very short open access article that I very strongly recommend you read. 10 Simple Rules for Getting Help from Online Scientific Communities. Um, these 10 simple rules start with, don't be afraid to ask a question. State the question clearly. Learn established customs before posting. Don't ask what has already been answered, which is probably one of the, hard, one of the harder things to do. So if you actually read the paper, you will see that the message is, uh, you know, this is a hard thing to judge, but you should at least keep it in the back of your mind and try your best. Um, always use a good title. Do your homework before posting. So that has to do with don't ask what has already been answered. Proofread your post. Be courteous to other forum members. Remember that the archive of your question can be helpful to others. So try to make it as general as possible and give back to the community. If you have been benefiting from an online community, start giving back to it uh, when you start feeling like, I think I have, uh, I think I can answer these questions for others as well. So suppose that, let's see how we can create a good question. I'll give you an R example again. Suppose that my goal is to basically come up with these uh, character strings, 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, okay? Um, Here's a question. I'm trying to create the following vector in R. So I define X to be one through five and Y to be the first five letters of the alphabet. But when I add them, I get the following error. What do I do? Now this seems like this person who asked the question gave some uh, good explanation, but in reality, we have no idea what they did. So it's really, really helped. Uh, when somebody's question uh, is in this form and you really have no idea what they did. Instead, we can uh, try something a little bit better. I'm trying to create the following vector in R. Below is a screenshot of what I tried. Why is it not working? Now, this does one better because now we have a screenshot of what they tried. Um, and so we can see what 
code they ran and what code actually gave them the error. But the thing is, they gave us a screenshot. So now, if I want to run this code, I have to type it out one by one. And let's remind ourselves that this is a really short, small, silly example. Chances are the real questions you have are a lot lengthier than this. So if your question is accompanied by a screenshot, trust me, nobody's going to write out your code um, and actually try to answer the question on an online community. And more importantly, even if somebody did genuinely want to write out what you had typed out and posted a photograph of on their end, um, chances are you made some silly mistake like a typo somewhere. If that's the case, when they're copying things over, they're probably not going to copy over the typo as well. So even when they do try to help you, it's it would be really hard for them to replicate what you did. So um, writing good questions has its tools as well. So in R, one way of doing this is using a package called Reprex, which stands for Reproducible Example. And I'll give you the R example here, but this package has been so very popular within the R community that actually there's a Python version of this as well. So, and there may be others as well. I'm aware of the two of them and there may be others as well. So look for tooling that might help you ask good questions. And the way Reprex works is basically it prepares reproducible examples for posting questions for GitHub, Stack Overflow or Slack snippets. So what you do is, again, the same question, Below is what I tried, what does this error mean and how can I fix it? So with Reprex, you can actually copy um, your code and run that uh, a function called Reprex on it. And that creates a, a kind of a text stream for you and puts it in your clipboard that you can just paste directly into something like a GitHub issue that also has the errors commented out. So if the person who wants to help you comes across, they can actually copy your code and paste it into their R session and rep, uh, reproduce your code. And more importantly, it runs your code in a completely fresh R session. And it tells you if your code isn't reproducible in a fresh session, it tells you, hey, I can't reproduce your code. You need to give me more information before I can create a reproducible snippet for you that you can then share with others. Uh, number four is contribute to community. So. One thing you might do is find open source projects that you enjoy and start contributing. Um, you might contribute to books, for example. The, one of the popular books are for data science. They actually do a good job of like acknowledging people who contribute to the book. So my name was acknowledged, but I want to show you, this is um, kind of a, a, a screenshot from a couple of years ago, I think. But at this time when my name was on there, um, I, had a, I had made some contributions to the book, but here's a pull request that I had um, uh, made. And these are the types of changes that at the time I had committed. So they're useful, but they're typos. Uh, they are going to help the next reader, but you can see that they're not like substantial contributions, meaning that you do not have to be a super expert on a topic to be able to make contributions at this level. As you're reading a book, if it's an open source book, and you catch an issue, go ahead and quickly open a pull request and, um, and you know, start getting the hang of this workflow, but also start getting used to doing things like community, uh, contributing to an open source project. You can also contribute to packages. Oftentimes, um, so here's an example of one contribution to a package. What I had done here is I had simply added an example. So this is not, when I say contribute to packages, it doesn't always mean build functionality. That might be something that comes later on in your data science journey or your software engineering journey. But contributing examples and documentation is a great place to get started for both kind of getting a uh, hang of how the community works and how these projects work without you needing to have, you know, super technical chops for building an R package itself. How do we go about contributing to an open source software? Um, we want to first get the pulse of a project. So, you know, check out if they have, they probably have a GitHub repository or something, check out to see how do the developers actually um, do uh, accept contributions. Watch the repository. So if there is a particular uh, piece of software or package that you use regularly, 
you may uh, click on the watch button on GitHub for it so you can get some notifications when either there are major releases happening or with every single issue with something very popular. You may not want to inundate your email, but there are options for doing that. Read the code, actually read the code to see how things are written. It doesn't matter if you're not necessarily understanding every single piece of it, but reading more code is going to get you used to the style of the code that's being written in that package. Uh, review the uh, code of conduct and also a contributing guide. Many, many um, projects that are open source software projects have these things and they're really important to be aware of before you make a contribution. And also discuss your ideas. This is especially true if you're thinking of um, contributing something more substantial, which may not be your first contribution, but if you're thinking of contributing something a little more substantial than just typos, uh, you probably want to first, you know, open an issue and ask the developers, is this the sort of thing that would be of interest? Um, and then finally, for your contribution, make a pull request. So what I'd like to do um, in a few minutes is actually make a live pull request with you so you can get a hang of how these things work. So we're going to make a pull request to one of the Tidyverse packages, um, Redar, which is a package for reading data into R. And this is a screenshot from the, um, from the um, website for the package where you can see under the reference tab on the package, you can basically see a list of all of the functions and then some documentation on those functions. And I'd like to draw your attention to that uh, header called column parsers. So there's a list of functions that are column parsers in R. And let's, uh, let's read that first sentence. Column parsers define how a single column is parsed or a parse a single vector. There's a typo in that sentence. I think it's supposed to say, or how to parse a um, single vector, right? So let's go ahead and actually make this pull request. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, stop sharing for one second and then share my whole screen with you over here. And what I have done is I have gone to the GitHub um, repository for this um, package. And I am then going to find where that uh, typo uh, happened. I think let's go ahead and that would be, uh, you might search for it. So maybe uh, just so I can do the full process, it's a define parsers, nope, sorry, parsers define. look for this um, character string. So it looks like it's in this file called packagedown.yaml. And if I scroll down over here, we can see column parsers define how a single column is parsed or a parse a single vector. So we basically want to edit this file and say, or how to parse a single vector. So in order to be able to do that, I'm going to click on the um, edit button here, which basically will tell me that I don't have uh, access to write to this repository. I'm not an owner of this. So it says you're making changes in a project you don't have right access to. We've created a fork of this project for you. So what a fork means is that I've now made a copy of this that I own that I can commit to, and then I will send a pull request with my changes. So let's go down and make that change or how to parse a single vector. Um, let's propose, uh, the, uh, we'll write a commit message that's informative, um, fix typo, and I'll say it is, or how to parse A. And let's go ahead and propose these changes. And now that I've done this, it basically says it's comparing what I have in my, uh, in the version of this repository that I own 
to the uh, tidyverse version of it. And I can go ahead and review the changes that I made. And I like th those changes. So I'm going to create a pull request. And let's write a, a pull request. And that's basically it. We're now going to find out if this is going to get merged or not. It's probably not going to happen right away. A lot of open source uh, packages or a lot of kind of software uh, packages will have some automated checks that run on them whenever somebody wants to contribute something. They want to make sure that I didn't break something else. So these are some of those automated checks. So nobody would merge this before these checks run anyway. But my goal here was just to say I have now made a contribution to an open, open source software package. So let me go ahead and go back to sharing my slides. And this is the sort of thing you can do as well. Um, if you are interested in making um, such uh, changes, uh, one of the things you might look for is go into your, the repository of some of your favorite projects and look for things that say good first issue. Um, uh, here's another idea. Um, there's currently a sprint going on for this project, which is basically about translating to many languages, data science terms. But it's happening as part of Hacktoberfest, uh, where a lot of open source projects basically make a bunch of issues available for uh, new contributors to contribute to uh, during October. So you might be interested in that. And finally, uh, collaborate with others. So you might collaborate on process. Um, so things like pair programming is really, really useful for that. Um, so whenever you are working on projects, I would recommend doing things like pair programming. Um, you might collaborate in classes. Uh, so if you are already have to write some sort of a report for your class, think about where else it might go. Do obviously check in with your course instructors that that's okay, but then you might turn them into a blog post, a portfolio entry, or a competition submission. So there, are, there's always, always some Kaggle competition running that tends to be about predictive modeling you might be interested in. Um, there are two um, competitions uh, specifically for undergraduates called the Undergraduate Research Project Competition. That's if you're doing like a semester long research or undergraduate class project competition, which is just you have a project you did as part of coursework. So if you want to submit those, you can do that. And it doesn't have to be any extra work for your uh, course organizers. You might also collaborate outside of class. So at the beginning with my bio, uh, we mentioned that uh, I run the DataFest event here. This is just one example of something like a hackathon -y event that you might take part in. There are many, many of these such events. It's almost at this point, you might be thinking, OK, um, which ones of these are worthwhile to participate in? So this is one option. Be selective about them, but I think they're good ways to both get some practice and make some friends and network. And finally, broadcast your work. So if you're interested in data visualizations, I strongly recommend the Tidy Tuesday project. Every Monday, there's a data set released. And every Tuesday, you'll see people tweeting with the Tidy Tuesday hashtag of data visualizations they have made using data uh, that was released. And it's so kind of inspiring to see everything people are doing. And everyone also shares their code as well with it. Um, you might consider speaking at events. So here, I mentioned these three groups. Um, Many of us are always looking for speakers, and a speaker doesn't mean you're going to have to fill a one hour slot. It could just be we often do five minute lightning talks as well. So reach out to event organizers if there's things you want to talk about. I would recommend attending a couple events first, but they're good venues to kind of uh, hear and be heard write blog posts. And if you are interested in writing blog posts, obviously you can use whatever platform you like. But if you are an R user, there's some really good um, information here um, in terms of how to get started with uh, using this package called Blogdown, which allows you to blog directly from R. I'll post these slides and give you a link to them so you can get back to these URLs that I'm suggesting along the way. Um, and for keeping your blog alive, if you are going to do it, it's actually really not easy to keep a blog alive, but try to find co-authors. Don't do it by yourself. Try to keep it regular, even if that's just once a month. 
uh, write themed posts. So maybe you're attending this conference this week. This might be something to review, for example. So here are the six things that we talked about. Always be curious, improve your workflow, share your output, contribute to community, collaborate with others and broadcast your work. And to wrap things up, I'd like to mention one other thing that's extremely important. Be aware of the impact of your work as a data scientist. Um, I think we often get uh, kind of wrapped up in things like tooling and even workflow, and then sometimes um, not see the bigger impact of our work. But if you are going to be a data scientist, especially if you're going to be working on things like machine learning and AI, I very, very strongly recommend reading these two books. Um, and there are many more like this that are extremely worthwhile to read. But um, as much as your work could be used uh, for good, it might actually have very biased uh, negative implications as well. And you might be thinking, I'm very much at the beginning of the road, but this is the time to learn about these, not after um, it's too late. So as you're uh, kind of honing your skills in terms of the tooling, I strongly recommend that you're also keeping a good kind of uh, reading list to be a well-rounded data scientist who actually understands the impact of their work as well. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions and the slides are posted at this link. Um, so that you can go back and get the URLs if you were interested in any of the materials I shared. Wow, thank you so much. That was an amazing talk and I love how you integrated the live component. I think a lot of people are really gonna appreciate that. So uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat, so I think we'll just get right to them. So the first question, I think you've already kind of answered this, but maybe you can add a little bit more. Uh, what do you think are the key skills necessary to succeed in this field? Um, so I think that there are a couple obvious ones, which is that um, you ultimately will need to be good at a programming language. And what I would recommend is that being actually good at a single programming language and then having some awareness of how other programming languages work. Um, is more important than being mediocre at like multiple programming languages, I would say just to begin with at least. Um, but more importantly, as you're learning a programming language, I would strongly recommend that you are also um, thinking about how you can learn the next thing. Um, for being a data scientist in general, I have to say uh, learning something like R or Python is extremely useful. But beyond that, another thing is uh, learning some SQL <laughs> when we're talking about tooling is going to be important. That's one thing. Workflow is something else we talked about. And that's something that is uh, you want to start learning about and developing one that works for you um, as early as possible. And uh, the third thing I would say is that trying to keep current and be kind of uh, flexible with learning new things um, to the best of your ability. You're not always expected to be using the newest, shiniest thing, but being able to read documentation to understand, is this the type of thing I might need? And if so, how would I go about learning it? I think that's an incredibly useful skill. Awesome. I think that's an amazing recap uh, and good insights. Next question is, what are the courses that you'd recommend to learn data science? Um, the courses, so from here at the university, you mean? I think they either mean university courses or online courses. Or online courses in general. So um, I think that like good introductions to certain programming languages will go a long way. So um, I know like I teach an introduction to data science course that's R based. I think there's a similar course offered by the School of Informatics here that is Python based. They're similar in some ways, different in others, but having something like that, that focuses not just on the programming language, but also the workflows and also the aspect of working with data. So we're not just uh, teaching software engineering, but we're actually teaching programming to make sense of data. So courses that actually touch on those are incredibly helpful. Um, there are lots of good courses online as well. I know a few that are on Coursera. I think there's like a pretty decent series of courses from Johns Hopkins on Coursera. 
There are also lots and lots of free courses, especially when it comes to not like big overviews, but more specialized things. So for example, for natural language processing or something like that. Um, so I think having a more of a structured course at the introductory level to get a good sense of how the tooling works and then adding on to that shorter modules uh, for specific skills is probably the way to go uh, for self-learning. And the other thing I will mention is I mentioned these meetup groups, for example, they're not always just speakers. Uh, oftentimes they're workshops as well. So you might look into some like hands-on activities like that where you're learning with other people and they all tend to be free. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what's your typical day like? I know you're, you've got a lot of different hats that you wear, so I'm curious to hear this myself. Um, so I am a faculty member here at the university. I am also a data scientist and educator with our studio. So I try to split my time between these things. And so my typical day, um, let's see, in the mornings, I do a batch of emails. Uh, more often than not, some of these involve things like GitHub issues or pull requests to projects that I run. So that data science course in the box is one that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I like going through those. Um, I also try to set aside some time in the mornings for some writing. I'm currently working on a book on like an introductory statistics book. Um, and mornings are a good time for me to write so I try to get some writing done in the mornings if I'm able to do so. Uh, right now at least one of my days of the week is basically set aside for video recording for the course that I'm teaching so that's that's something that is new to my life to make that many videos this regularly uh, but that's something else. And then um, I try to split my time between course prep which tends to basically mean uh, doing everything in R that's the uh, what I teach, but also the tooling I use to generate my course slides, generate my course website, everything. So I do a little bit of that. I try to come up with new assignments for courses using like newer data sets. There's always something happening current that we can incorporate into the classroom. So I try to work on a mini project like that. Um, and then the remainder of the time, I go back to the projects that I maintain to see sort of any sort of updates uh, that need to happen. But I would say that I think I probably have R and R Studio open in front of me. I imagine like 90% of the time that I'm working. Wow, you really are an ambassador for R. Um, oh, there's another question. Uh, that was, okay, I think there's more of a comment uh, and question. So that was so interesting. Thank you. What sort of backgrounds do data scientists have? Any physicists per chance? How can you get into data science, a data science career with no formal stats or comp sci qualifications, et cetera? I, I, absolutely. There are actually lots of people who come into data science from the natural sciences as well. So um, I think that actually physicists tend to have like a good computational background, lots of work in C, I feel like, or C++. So uh, they, there's definitely kind of like things uh, they background they have that tends to be relevant to uh, stuff that data scientists will be working on. There's really, I think data science is a very, very interdisciplinary field. So as long as you are interested in working with data, I feel like there is room for that. Um, it also depends on the type of work you want to do as a data scientist. So as a data scientist, you could be working more closer to uh, data engineers. Um, where you want to have a good understanding of things like working with databases, or you could be working closer to uh, doing statistical work where you're doing more of the modeling. So I think that if a person doesn't come into the field with any modeling background, chances are the first thing they're going to do is not going to be to m build machine learning models. But these are all things that are absolutely learnable um, if you are you know, willing to um, kind of grow in that area. Uh, but at least to start with, there may be other aspects of the data science cycle, whether that's kind of various ways to store data, read data into software, writing more efficient software for doing data science that uh, you can be involved with, even if you're not doing the modeling day to day. 
Okay, thank you. And that actually ties in really nicely to my next question. This is for me personally, which is that a lot of undergraduates like myself who are perhaps in their penultimate year of study want to do data science internships or, or grad schemes, uh, but they often look for master's or PhD students. So do you think it's still worth applying for undergrads who are, who are interested in this sort of thing? I think it is worth applying, yes. Um, so I think, uh, you know, oftentimes these... Uh, these requirements are posted and it's not to say they're not real, but I think that if you are truly interested in a position, there is no harm in applying. Um, I, as long as you have the other skills that are listed, you know, you wanna not necessarily be like a complete shot in the dark, but if you have the other qualifications listed, but you happen to not have the MS degree, for example, but you feel like your undergraduate background is strong enough, I would recommend um, posting those. I think there are variety of reasons why um, there aren't as many data science undergraduate internships. And I imagine that number will only grow in time. Uh, one of them is that lots of um, businesses doing data science are um, kind of, there are lots and lots of smaller startups doing these and they usually don't tend to take on a whole lot of interns. So that may be one of the reasons. Um, Another one is that if companies have established um, internship programs in other parts of their business, like software engineering, maybe they haven't yet started like a good program for a data science internship for undergraduates. Um, but as I said, I imagine these numbers will only go up in time. And I, I would encourage you to apply as long as you're checking the other boxes. Thanks, that, that's really great advice. Um, if you could go back in time to when you were sort of, you know, 20 years old in the latter part of your undergraduate years and, and give the younger Mina any piece of advice, what would it be? So I didn't learn programming until I was in graduate school. I think I would have started earlier and this wasn't because of avoidance or anything. It's just the program I was in. I was an actuarial science major, did not really have that as a component. Um, and I think I wish I had started earlier not to say that I haven't learned quite a bit later on, uh, but I think it would have given me more confidence when I was in graduate school to try out some of these things a bit earlier. So I think I, I wish I had started that. Um, having gone to graduate school for statistics, I will say I wish I had paid more attention in my linear algebra course. <laughs> I did learn it the second time around, but I remember learning lots and lots of math in undergrad and not quite having a reference for where they will become useful until, to be perfectly honest, later on in my graduate school. So I think one of the things that I would uh, encourage myself to do is to ask more questions about where things will be relevant, because uh, it turns out that I am an applied statistician, basically. I like the application side of things, and they give me the motivation to keep working on problems, um, but that I kind of recognize that a little bit later. And if I had recognized that earlier, I think I would have asked questions differently. Wow, okay, very interesting. Uh, we have a final question that just came through on the chat, which is, can we apply data science in robotics, for example? Um, I yeah, absolutely. So I think there is, um, you know, that's not like an area I'm necessarily, uh, I have expertise in, but I, very much imagine that uh, machine learning models are used uh, for robotics problems. So yes, I think that this becomes an issue. So there are, I think, like two aspects of data science that I can think of that would become relevant. One of them is actually the experimental design side of things. Because if you are building anything robotics related, you want to have a good testing paradigm for like, is this actually working? Um, and so that's like more on the kind of the statistics experimental design side of things. The other one is going to be about the predictive modeling aspect of if X happens, what's the likelihood that Y is going to happen next? And how do you build a system that actually can react to that? So that's certainly something that is uh, within what would be classified as data science related work. Alrighty, and uh, there was another comment that just came through, which is that if you could share the link of the lessons that you gave, I think they're referring to the slides, perhaps. So I, I know yeah, you had I the can... bit of the why. So I'll just post that in the chat. Yeah, that sounds good. 
So uh, what is the what is the link if you could uh, if you could share it? It's bitly uh, grow ds future grow dash ds dash future. future. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll put that in the chat. Uh, for people to access. Okay. So that brings the time. Um, so thank you so much for coming today. I think a lot of people learn a lot of things. Uh, this recording will be available after the fact. So if you want to rewatch parts of it that you missed or you want to watch it in your own time, you can, you can do so. Uh, so I'm going to go 